First Baptist Church. Welcome to worship. Colossians 1 says this, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him are all things hold, that hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. From in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Amen. Again, welcome. Will you stand and uh, sing with us to this God of ours? And it's spreading like a wildfire in my heart. Sunday morning, hallelujah. And it's lasting all week long. Can you hear it? Can you feel it? It's a rhythm of a gospel song. Once you choose it, you can lose it. There ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. I got an old church choir singing in my soul. I've got a sweet salvation. It's beautiful. I've got a heart overflowing because I've been restored. There ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. Oh no, there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy when the valleys that I wander, turn to mountains that I can't climb. You are with me, never leave me. There ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. I've got an old church choir singing in my soul. I've got a sweet salvation. It's beautiful. I've got a heart overflowing because it's been your hands and stop your feet till you find that gospel because he's all you'll ever need oh you'll ever need clap your hands and stop your feet till you find that gospel because he's all you'll ever need oh you'll ever need clap your hands and stop your feet till you find that gospel because he's all you'll ever need oh you one more time clap your hands and stop your feet till you find Y'all can be seated, and here's just a few things to make sure we put on our calendars. Help through yesterday's trunk or treat. You made it possible to serve our community during this difficult year. All parents, don't forget, Elevate is back. Make sure to drop your children off at the check-in at the youth building before the morning service. Everyone, make sure to grab a shoebox in the foyer and bring it home and fill it up for Operation Christmas Child. We will have a prayer dedication on November 15th, so make sure to bring your shoeboxes back before the 15th. At Troy First Baptist, we take a country every week and pray for it. Today, we ask that you take a moment and pray for the people of Guadalupe. Leadership training for the growing churches is provided locally through the evangelical churches. Pray that national Christian workers may be called for service at home and to the Francophone lands around the world. Let's pray for Guadalupe. Heavenly Father, we pray for this nation. God, we lift up every single individual 
God, we pray for them as a nation, and we pray for, pray for them as individuals, God, that you would reach those individual hearts and use those individual hearts to reach the entire country with your gospel, with your word. Lengthen and build resources to, to strengthen Christians in Guadalupe. And God, bring the lost to you. That's our prayer. Be with our brothers and sisters and equip them, Lord. We love you. In your name I pray. Amen. Would you stand and sing this next song with us? Open up the heavens. For this day, we're gathered in your name, calling out to you. Your glory, your glory like a fire, awakening desire, burn our hearts. He's the reason, you're the reason we're here, you're the reason we're seeing it. Open up the heavens, we want to see it. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise. Whoa, 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 your presence, your presence in this place, your glory on our face. Looking to the sky, you're standing like a cloud. You're standing with us now, Lord of the Light. He's the reason. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're seeing. Open up the heavens, we wanna see it. Open up the floodgates, a mighty. your glory show us show us your power show us show us your glory Lord sing that out show us show us show us your glory show us show us your power show us show us your glory Lord sing Lift up your voices one more time. Show us. Show us. Show us your glory. Show us. Show us your power. Show us. Show us your glory, Lord. Open up. Open up the heavens. We want to see it. Open up the floodgates. A mighty river flowing from your heart. You can be seated. I'll fly away, oh glory. I'll fly away when I die. Hallelujah, by and by. I'll fly.
Father, we come before you one more time. God, we ask that you be with us this morning, that you would be with our ears, make them listening, and obedient ears, be with our hands, make them obedient to your call. And God, I pray that today we would find that, that meaning of holiness in mirroring you in your kingdom. God, we love you. Be with us today, with our hearts, with our minds that we may reach the lost for you as our purpose today. It's your holy, precious, and awesome name we pray in your name. And everybody said, Amen. And the sign says, no smoking pets. I suppose they meant no smoking and no pets, but to save a little bit of ink and effort, a little bit of poor planning, they told us that there could be no smoking pets. Is that really a problem anywhere? And the sign at Divine Shepherd Lutheran Church says, try these four letter words, grace, love, and next, grace, love, and pray. Nice thought, good intentions. What's wrong with this sign? Good theology, bad math. Can you find the non-four-letter words? Those two I found on the internet. This one I found on my phone. At a local store, I took this picture. You might recognize the store from its familiar signage. And the sign says, rollback. Was $1.48. Now, two for $3. I not only took a picture, I quick called my wife and said, should we stock up before the price goes back down? And here's my favorite. And the sign says, caution, this sign has sharp edges. Do not touch the edges of this sign. And the bottom says in the small print that you probably can't read, also the bridge is out ahead. What's wrong with this sign? Font size, priorities, risk assessment. We may laugh at many signs because they are misguided, misworded, misspelled. Ever see a school sign spelled S-H-C-O-L-O-L? School ahead. But our resentment at many signs is not because of their stupidity or their ugliness, because you know, they're blocking out the scenery and breaking our mind, but because of their authority telling us what we can and can't do. Do this, don't do that. Can't you read the sign? Signs tell us what to do, and more often, what not to do. And we don't usually take too kindly to that. But signs are usually posted by someone who knows better than we do, someone who's been there before us and warns us about some impending danger, like a bridge being out or sharp edges on the sign. Signs, by their very nature, must be short and to the point in order to be read by speeding traffic. And in our quick paced society, we call it life in the fast lane, we need for some signs for the times to direct us to God and to right living. And that's exactly what James gives us in James chapter 4, verses 6 through 10. Here we will find eight road signs for the narrow road. Eight short, sweet, some not so sweet commandments to warn us, to direct us. Since we left off in James chapter 3 during the summer, 
James has been talking to us about wisdom. He taught us about earthly wisdom and a wisdom from above in James chapter 3, verse 17. There we learn that wisdom is not the accumulation of knowledge, but the application of truth to life. Not what I know, but how I live. Then we picked up two weeks ago in James chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, where James taught us about wars between us that come from that earthly wisdom within us. Last week we left off in verses 4 and 5 where James exploded on us, calling us names and warning us about consorting with the enemy, cheating on God. He told us not to try to be friends with the world system. We ended up in the end of verse 6 with, He gives more grace. But now we pick up with what that grace does. James 4, 6, He gives more grace. Therefore, He said, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. This is a quote from Proverbs chapter 3, verse 34. James is sometimes called the Proverbs of the New Testament. It is the most Old Testament of the 27 books of the New Testament, and it is full of wisdom. This verse is also quoted in 1 Peter 5.5. 5. It tells us that God resists the proud, like we are supposed to resist enemies in verse 4. It literally takes a position against and the proud are those who think they are something, think they don't need God, like we learned about in Daniel chapter 4 with Nebuchadnezzar. But he gives grace, he takes a position for the humble. Not those who think negatively about themselves. We learn that humility is actually thinking honestly about ourselves from God's point of view. And this is an important biblical principle we learned in Daniel chapter 4. Humility is the prerequisite for God's grace. If you want God's grace, you have to humble yourself. God doesn't give it to you. If you're proud, He actually resists you. The proud don't think they need it, and they don't get it. The humble know they need it, and though they don't deserve it, God gives it to them. So, verse 7, so therefore, we actually have the word therefore picking up in verse 7. Here are eight ways to be Humble. Here are eight road signs for the narrow road. One, submit to God. Two, resist the devil. Three, draw near to God. Four, cleanse your hands. Five, purify your hearts. Six, lament and mourn and weep. Seven, let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves, verse eight, or in verse 10, is number eight. Let's look at each one of those road signs. The first one we'll call a yield sign. He says in verse 7, therefore submit to God. You ever pulled up on an on-ramp to a highway, even here just on 73, and there's a yield sign there because you don't have the right of way, the traffic that's already on the highway does. But sometimes a timid soul will pull up to the yield sign in front of me, put on their brakes, come to stop, put it in park, I think, and I wait and I wait and I wonder if they're waiting for God to open up the Red Sea and stop all traffic so they can pull in. And I want to roll down the window and say, it says yield, not surrender. But God wants us to yield and surrender to Him. As a matter of fact, the wisdom from above we saw in chapter 3 verse 17 was willing to yield. If God only gives grace to the humble, then it only makes sense that we drop our self-sufficiency and our haughtiness and yield to God. We saw the word resist in verse 6. We are supposed to resist, and uh, we take a position against literally. But this is a different word. It's a more active word. It's actually take a position, move underneath something. Take a position underneath. Line up under. It's not technically obedience, but it's the attitude of surrender, a will that leads to it. Wisdom from below, the world system says, do your own thing. Call your own shots. Be your own boss. Assert yourself. After all, as we saw a couple weeks ago, you came to be served. But God says, put yourself last. Come to serve. Yield to whom? Well, not only to God, but Romans 13.1 says, submit to government. Now, this is a touchy subject right now when the government's intruding in our lives and telling us that we can or can't worship. We can't go to work. These governing authorities tell us what to do and we chafe. And we say, well, Paul wasn't writing to this oppressive government. 
No, he wasn't. They were living underneath Rome that was executing Christians, the government that would make him a martyr. And Paul says in Romans 13, 1, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority, does that include the USA, except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Now, if we reap what we sow, the Bible certainly tells us that we do, then every nation gets the government they deserve, and no nation more so than us. We get the government we deserve because we choose it every two years. And shame on you if you complain about the government and haven't shown up to vote yet or don't vote on Tuesday. Peter says the same thing in 1 Peter 2.13, Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. So if the government says wear a mask, wear a mask. If the government says drive 55 miles an hour, drive 55 miles an hour. As Christians, we ought to be the best citizens, not the worst. We ought not to be the ones looting and rioting. We ought to be the ones building up. We ought to be the most responsible neighbors, the safest drivers. May sound self-serving, but the Bible also tells us to obey and submit to church leaders, who in Hebrews 13, 17, obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. They watch out for your souls and 1 Corinthians 16, 16 says, submit to such and to everyone who works and labors with us. Children are also to submit to parents, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1, for this is right. I know I hear children, especially teenagers, say all the time, but you don't know my parents. No, I don't. But I know who gave them to you. Your parents don't go to church? Well, then you be a better child. Don't be the rebellious child. You and youngers are supposed to submit to elders, 1 Peter 5, 5. Employees are supposed to submit to employers. You get to choose who you work for, don't you? And so we learn from 1 Peter 2.18, Servants, be submissive to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the harsh. Hey, Paul tells us in Colossians 3.22, Obey in all things your masters, not with eye service, not just when they're looking. You see, as Christians, we ought to be the best employees, the most trustworthy, the hardest working, because we know that God has placed authority in our life. So who else are we supposed to be submissive to? Are we supposed to wave the white flag and surrender to everybody? Look for someone else to submit to? Actually, Ephesians 5.21 says we need to submit to each other, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Now, if you have a hard time submitting, maybe it's not the policeman who was wrong. Maybe it's not the IRS who was wrong. Maybe it's not your parents or your boss who's wrong. Maybe it's a problem in your heart. Maybe we have a hard time submitting to the authority in our lives because we have not actually surrendered to the God who put them there. We don't like being told what's to do, what to do, and that's the problem. The problem with signs, they dare to tell us how fast we can go, which way we can and can't go, and that doesn't sit well with us. One day when I was much younger, I had a young man in my car who I was witnessing to. He was rebelling against God in his life, and he said, all of God's rules are arbitrary kind of like those 55 mile an hour speed limit signs. I, I don't, 55 is not a magic number. And so I got a bright idea. We were coming up to a stop sign. I said, you know, that stop sign up there is kind of arbitrary. I stepped on the gas. I said, I think I should have the right of way. He got real nervous and started pressing the imaginary brake. And, uh, and then I stopped and I obeyed the stop sign. I said, may seem arbitrary to you, but if you ignore the signs, it may be at your own peril. God says yield. Yield to the signs in your life, the authorities in your life. Submit to one another. And God says, submit to me. The second sign I'll call a caution sign. He says, resist the devil in the end of verse 7. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Now, I know there are some who say, oh, come on, you don't believe in the fairy tale, the devil, do you? I remember at one of my Ivy League schools, a professor who was making fun of a classmate who talked about the devil. And she looked at me and said, Jeff, now she knew I was the token conservative in the class, you don't believe in the devil, do you? And I knew I had an opportunity to stand up for the truth. I also knew I had the chance to be laughed at. But I also knew that Jesus promised that uh, the Holy Spirit would give us words to say, and the Holy Spirit did give me words to say. I didn't quote scripture to them. They didn't necessarily take scripture as a, uh, an authority in their life. But I said, you know, when I read the news, when I look at what goes on around me and what goes on inside of me, I have a hard time not recognizing that there seems to be a conspiracy of evil in the world. 
And it almost seems like there's some intelligent person behind it. And I can see some students in the class actually nodding their head and going, yeah, that sounds logical. It doesn't just seem random to me. How about you? Yes, I do believe because I have not only seen it in the Bible, but I've seen him at work in my world and in my life this week. How about you? Seems to me if there is a devil, we ought to be cautious of him. But notice that James doesn't say run or hide. He says what? Resist. Now here is a different word than the one used of God resisting the proud. This one is take a stand against. God takes a position against. We take a stand against. This one's positional. It says the same thing in Ephesians 6, 11, and 13. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand, stand against the wiles of the devil. Verse 13, therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, to stand. Notice that he is on the offensive attacking us. We don't need to go trying to pick a fight with him. He's already picking a fight with us. But we're not supposed to back down, and neither do we need to go on the offensive against him. For 1 Peter 5, 8 tells us, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And there's the word again, resist him steadfast in the faith. There is an adversary, here's a caution sign, there is an adversary who wants to and is trying to destroy us. Now the roaring lion here is a wonderful picture. I remember years ago I was at a camp in Alabama and we're riding a golf cart from the dorms where we were staying to where I was going to be speaking to the campers. And the camp director all of a sudden pulled over and he said, look, ahead, a rattler. I'd never seen a rattler in my life. And sure enough, right in the path was a rattler. He actually got out. And then he got his machete and I felt a little bit better. He cut the thing's head off and he put the beheaded snake in the back of our golf cart to take it and to, I guess, scare some campers. Half an hour later, I thought, you know, I need to take a picture of this and uh, send it to my wife. And so I reached down to this coiled headless snake and I picked up from the rattle side. And when I got it up to about here, the beheaded neck lunged up to bite my hand. And I didn't say, you don't have any fangs. No, I said, whoa, I dropped that thing. I was cautious because that beheaded snake somehow Without a brain, it still had some kind of nerve firings to lunge and attack me. That amazes me biologically. But that's a picture of the roaring lion. Remember that Jesus said, he will bruise my heel, but I will crush his head? Satan is a beheaded snake, a defanged snake. He is a roaring lion. You know what a roaring lion is? If you're ever in the jungle and you hear a roaring lion, don't go running up and try and pet it. But you don't need to be as frightened of the roaring lion. The roaring lion is the old toothless male who's making a lot of noise, hoping that you will be scared to death, fall over a heart attack, and he can have an easy lunch. What you need to be scared of is the young lioness who's out hunting, stealthily, quietly. The roaring lion can't sneak up on anybody, but the hunting lionesses, they're quiet. And Satan is the beheaded snake, is the roaring lion. And if you don't cower, you resist him. You know what will happen? Remember what James said, resist the devil, and he will flee from, you don't have to fight him, all you got to do is just put up a fight, and he will flee from you. There was an old movie, I think it was back in the 70s or 80s, called The Bear. And without any dialogue, you just watch this mama bear and baby bear. One time when the baby bear was alone, faced down a cougar, and the bear remembered what mom had taught, and so the baby bear raised up and let out a mighty roar, which was pretty weak and pitiful. But the cougar ran away, and the bear thought, wow, look at me, I'm just like mama. And then the camera angle changes, the camera pulls back, and what we see is that behind baby bear was mama bear roaring up, and the cougar ran away, not from the baby bear, but the mama bear. And that's exactly what happens when the devil flees from us. The devil is not running from us, but the one who stands behind us. He's a bully who runs away the first time you stand up, him because Jesus is behind you standing up. Don't ignore this caution sign. Satan is not a, he's not a coward. Neither is he a policeman with a radar who's there to protect you. He's actually an adversary who's looking to destroy you. We'll call the third sign 
a one-way sign. There is one thing in life more important than resisting the devil, and it's drawing near to God. Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. Verse 8. More than just submit to Him. We saw that, yes, but draw near to Him. I know this is what we were made for, but this is a startling concept when you stop to think about it. Remember the God of the Old Testament who did not say draw near. As a matter of fact, He put a fence around Mount Sinai, and He told Moses, Exodus 19, 12, you shall set bounds, boundaries, fences for the people all around saying, take heed to yourselves that you do not go up to the mountain or touch his base. Whoever touches the mountain shall be surely put to death. Wow. We have these keep out signs and the sign says trespassers will be shot to death. The God of the Old Testament doesn't seem very approachable, does he? He was holed up in the Holy of Holies inside the temple. Now the temple had walls. There was the outer court, and inside that, the inner court, only Jews could go. And then inside that, another court that only men could go. Inside that, the holy place that only priests could go. And inside that, the holy of holies, that only one priest could go and one time a year. Draw near to him, this inapproachable God, this holy God who gives us the death sentence. Yes, actually... Hebrews 7.19 says, the law, the Old Testament, made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is a bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. God has not a fence around His dwelling place. He has a welcome mat out. Hebrews 10.19 says, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, verse 22, let us draw near. Here I get a picture of President Kennedy, uh, a young president for the first time in a long time with little kids. And there's a picture of little John climbing under his desk, crawling under his feet. You know, no one else could get in the White House, uh, into the Oval Office, but little John could. That's my boy. He can come in anytime he wants. That's the picture of us. God saying, come on in, climb on my lap. What a privilege, one we too often miss. I say it all the time. The tragedy of life is not what happens to us, but what we miss, and we miss out on drawing near to God. What will happen if we resist Satan? He will flee. What will happen if we draw near to God? He will draw near to us. Doesn't that sound good? What would you like more than having God draw close to you? Are there any conditions on this drawing near to God? Glad you asked. There are two. Psalm 24, verses 3 and 4 say, Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who may stand in his holy place? Two conditions. He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Two conditions. You want to come close. Clean hands, pure heart. I'm pretty sure James had devotions in Psalm 24, the day he wrote this book. I think he had these words in mind because that's the next two signs. Step number four, sign number four, we'll call a stop sign. Draw near to God, you need clean hands. So let's call it... Cleanse your hands, O sinners, a stop sign. Notice James doesn't tell them, call them brothers. He says, cleanse your hands, you sinners. Doesn't quite call us adulterers and adulteresses this time, but he calls us sinners. Was this a rule in your house growing up? Was this a rule in your house when you had small kids? Don't come to the table with dirty hands. Get back up there and wash your hands. Are we going to rush into the presence of God with dirty hands? Did you put some antiseptic on your hands as you came into church this morning, maybe for the first time in a long time, or maybe the first time ever. Why do we do that? Actually, the Old Testament, New Testament Israel took this very literally. No wonder in Exodus 30, Moses wrote, Aaron and his son shall wash their hands and feet when they go into the tabernacle, or when they come near the altar, they shall wash with water, lest they die. So they shall wash their hands and their feet, lest they die. You ever go to a restaurant restroom and see the little sign on the mirror that says, employees must wash their hands before they go back to work? And you sure hope they do. But have you ever seen one that says, lest they die? No. So the Israelites became obsessed with washing. They got pretty OCD about it. They washed a certain way, certain times. They got so upset about it. Remember in Mark chapter 7, hung up on the ritual, when they saw some of the disciples eat bread with defiled, that is, with unwashed hands, they found fault. 
For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands in a special way, holding the tradition of the elders. They became like surgeons who washed for 15 minutes all the way up to the elbow, and they did it that way because they got wrapped up in the tradition. But don't miss what this symbol was supposed to teach them and to teach us. God wants us to cleanse our hands, not just our heart, but our hands, because it is the works of our hands that Revelation 9.20 says that God is concerned about. Our hands represent all that we do. If, as we said, wisdom is application, James 1.22 said, be doers of the word and not hearers only. For as James 2.26 said, faith without works is dead. So he wants us, don't come here without your hands being clean, to, to confess our sins. We uh, might now not be as concerned about washing our hands before dinner because we've already cleansed our hands 20 times all day with the antiseptic. But clean hands are great, and I'm a little bit OCD about it, even before the virus. I was always pretty fastidious about my hands. In college, during the summer, I worked as a bread truck driver, and that is a dirty-handed job because I carried bread into restaurants and to stores on dirty trays. And every single stop, I had 35 to 50 stops a day, I'd carry in these dirty trays, my hands would be black, I'd wash my hands, and then go in the very next stop. My hands would get black, and I'd wash my hands again. And I've taken that with me since, even before the virus, when I washed my hands in a public restroom, I always saved those paper towels to open up the door because I don't know if the person in front of me washed their hands. And then in those terrible restrooms where they didn't have paper towels, where they got one of those blow dryers, I had to get really you know, creative and open up the door with my foot or just wait for somebody else to come in so I could grab the door. Why? I, I want to be just as crazy about purity in my life as I am about washing my hands. How about you? We might forget about coming to dinner table with dirty hands, but what about a holy God? God says, no, 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 stop it. Two things, remember, though. It was clean hands and a pure heart. Notice the very next thing he says in James 4, 8. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. We'll call this a keep right sign. James says, purify your hearts, you double-minded. That comes from James 1.8. The root word for purify is make holy. And the idea is not cleanliness as, as much as it is singleness. We think holy means sinless, but a holy Bible, of course, doesn't sin. The idea is a set apart, save, like a saved seat. It's not saved from its sin, but it's set apart. The word is unmixed. Purity means unmixed. Pure water means no poison, no dirt. You can actually have pure dirt, can't you, if it's unmixed. The problem is mixing in what doesn't belong. And that's why he says in James 1.8, he is a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. Quit trying to have two wisdoms. Or as we saw last week in verse 4, adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? You can't befriend God and the world system. Make up your mind. You can't drive down the middle of the road. You'll get hit on both sides. So keep right. Sixth sign is somewhat startling. We'll call it the soft shoulder sign. James 4, 9 says, lament and mourn and weep. Get it? A shoulder to cry on. So wait a minute. You're thinking, did I come to the right place? I didn't come in here to get discouraged. Don't tell me to cry. I came here to be encouraged, to be cheered up. And now James and Pastor Hartman are becoming Johnny Raincloud. Debbie Downer hits us with lament, which means be miserable and wretched. Mourn, we know what that means. Weep, we know what that means. It's a passionate grief that can't be hidden. I read this word and I can't help but think of taking my daughter to a dog movie, Marley and Me. And spoiler alert, in the dog, Marley dies. Well, I was in a theater crowded with children and when Marley died, well, my daughter had a tear running down her cheek, but all the rest of the kids were mourning, lamenting, wailing. And I was laughing, I'm so sorry. It was so, f not at Marley, but at the kids. It was, and of course, at Field of Dreams, I was doing the same. I wasn't wailing, but I had tears rolling down my cheek. Is that what God is asking us to do here? It is biblical. Jesus, James' half-brother, said in the Beatitudes, blessed are those who mourn. This is kind of an oxymoron. Blessed are those who aren't blessed. Blessed means happy. Happy are those who are unhappy. Is that what Jesus is saying? 
Sounds strange. Because the emphasis in Scripture has always been on joy, right? Old Testament says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. My favorite verse in the Bible, this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it, not mourn and moan. Psalm 126, 2, he fills our mouth with laughter and our tongue with singing. Proverbs 17, 22, a merry heart does good like a medicine. In the New Testament, Paul in prison writes, Philippians 4, 4, rejoice in the Lord always. The fruit of the Spirit, wow, number two is joy. So what's up with this wet blanket verse? What do you mean, mourn, lament? Well, James is not saying that this kind of mourning, not M-O-R, but M-O-U-R mourning, should be characteristic of your whole life. Then we would have to change the sign out front to Sourpuss Baptist Church, where we're all baptized in pickle juice and we look like it. No, no, no. This kind of life, this is not mourning that's characteristic of our life, but characteristic of true repentance. Sin is no laughing matter. And when we repent of the adulterous lifestyle of verses 4 and 5, we have to have a remorse, not unending, as if there was no hope of forgiveness or restoration. Kind of like the tears of the woman in Luke 7, 38. She began to wash his feet with her tears. She wasn't laughing, but she was weeping because of her sin. Or Peter, not Judas, who went out in Luke 22 and wept bitterly because of his sin. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 7, 10, godly sorrow, godly sorrow produces, it produces something, repentance to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. The sorrow of the world leads to death, but this godly sorrow leads to life. It is temporary and it's productive. So God says, soften not just your shoulders, soften your heart. Maybe shed a tear and sign, sign everywhere, sign. There's two more. Number seven is a detour sign. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Wow. Obviously related to sign six. Obviously not all laughter, but certainly an appropriate laughter. You know how hard it is sometimes not to laugh in church, especially when you're a small child and you know you're going to get punished for it, or you never want to laugh at something funny in a funeral, but when it's most inappropriate, then you know you have the hardest time controlling it. Actually, Ecclesiastes 3, 4 says, there is a time to weep and a time to laugh. And a funeral's usually not a time to laugh unless someone's telling a funny story, a dear, endearing story about the departed. There is a time to mourn and a time to dance, but we need to learn appropriateness, right? The key is knowing which is which. We need to avoid the coarse jesting that Paul talks about in Ephesians 5, 3 and 4. Let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting. You know what I'm talking about, the questionable humor, the cutting remarks. When they start talking that way at work, maybe you change the subject or you go somewhere else. God says, take a detour. Don't even go there. Let that inappropriate laughter be turned to mourning. And then the last sign, save the best for last, kind of full circle, back to where we began. Remember, God gives grace to the humble. He says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. I'll call that a low clearance sign. You ever seen these low clearance signs? You ever see a truck that didn't look at the low clearance sign and then end up scraping up that overpass, that bridge? Go on YouTube and watch all the uh, low clearance signs that were disobeyed and the tragic results. Here, God says, humble yourself, actually rewords the Old Testament quote from verse 6. Don't make God humble you. You don't want him to humble you. You humble yourself. Get down and serve. It's a low underpass. Only the penitent man shall pass. And the last verse of the old song says, and the sign says, everybody welcome. Come in, kneel down, and pray. This is not focusing on who we are, or better, who we aren't. It's actually focusing on who he is. That's what humbling ourselves is. Philippians 2, 5 through 9 says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He humbled himself. Now, he had something to be proud of. None of us do. But he humbled himself so much that he laid down his life. Therefore, God has highly exalted him. And there is what God will do for you. If you humble yourself, he will exalt you. What do we do? 
If we humble ourselves, verse 6 says, he will give you grace. Verse 10 says, if we humble ourselves, he will lift you up. So do you want to lift yourself up? You want to try and lift yourself up by your own bootstraps? Not going to get very high, are you? Pride goes before a fall. Or do you want God to lift you up? The final word of the gospel is not humiliation, despair, condemnation, mourning, gloom, but a change that leads to exaltation, if we heed the signs. Here is the paradox of life. Freedom comes from obedience. Independence comes from dependence on God. Exaltation comes from humbling yourself. What did Jesus say? You want to be great? Lower yourself, become the servant of all. There's a beautiful example of this in the story of the prodigal son. You remember the prodigal son wanted his cut now. He basically said to dad, dad, I wish you were dead. You're worth more to me dead than alive. Give me my cut now. And humble dad did it. And he went off and he lived it up and he wasted it all and he ended up in the pig pen. Sometimes it takes a long time for us to reach bottom. We think we've reached bottom, but we can still go lower. He reached bottom, and he was literally in the pig pen. And there he finally came to himself, it says in Luke chapter 15. And he said, you know, I'd have it better off being a servant in my dad's house than being president of this pig pen. I'm going to go home, and I'm going to say, Dad, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. He rehearsed the lines all the way back home. And I'm sure on that narrow road back home, there were many broad roads that would have led him to more debauchery, but there was one narrow road that led home. And I'm sure on the way he passed some road signs, submit, resist, draw near, cleanse, mourn, bow. The same signs he saw on the way from his father's house, but he laughed at them. This time he didn't. There was nothing wrong with the signs. There was something wrong with him last time. He did all the things wrong before, but now he's on the way back home. And if we ignore the signs like him, we will be in the pig pen. You ever see an accident that was caused because some thoughtless person stole a stop sign? You don't have one of those stop signs in your attic or your basement, do you? You know, it's illegal to do that because it can cost a life. If the sign is removed, is that a good thing? No, actually it's not. The sign is there to help us, not to restrict us, but to free us. And so what happened when he finally humbled himself and he got home and he said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me your slave. What did the father do? The father said, let us eat and be merry. Yes, he said, I'm sorry I was wrong. Please forgive me. But the father didn't put him on probation, didn't send him off to work to repay his debt. He lifted him up. And so this young man found a wonderful four-letter word called grace. God wants to give us grace if we will humble ourselves in his sight. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for these road signs that are there to protect us. And Lord, I pray that you would help us not to ignore them at our own peril, but Lord, to take the time to humble ourselves to you, to submit to you, to draw near to you, to resist the devil. Lord, I pray that you would help us to rejoice, but you'd also help us when it's appropriate to mourn, to weep. Lord, if we can't find something to cry for in this world, then our, our crier is broke, our heart is, is dead. Lord, give us your heart. Break our heart for what breaks yours. And Lord, help us to ignore the signs and to share the warnings with others who are headed on the broad road. Lord, if there's one here today or one watching remotely who's never trusted in Christ, I pray that today they would come to an end of themselves, stop trying to save themselves, and humble themselves to you and receive your grace. For we know by grace we are saved through faith and not of works. Lord, I pray that they might say something like this to you in their heart and mean it. Lord, I know I'm a sinner, that I can't save myself, but I believe you died on the cross for me. Come into my heart and my life and make me your child. Make me what you want me to be. Lord, for those of us who are Christians, Lord, I pray that you'd help us get a hold of our heart. Lord, do what it takes to get our attention. The signs are big and blinking. We can't miss them, but we just don't heed them anymore. We get used to them. Lord, remind us, may each one of us today choose at least one of these signs. Focus on it and work on it in our life. For in Christ's name we pray, amen. Let's sing a very appropriate song this morning together. Would you stand with me, please? And we're going to sing...
I surrender all. Manya, could you just stand where you are and lead us in I surrender all?